I'd like to say first that as we uh, move more into my talk and our discussion, I encourage you to stay in touch with this feeling of uh, practicing with a warm heart. And there can be a sense of the ground of being as being fundamentally aware and present. And it's not indifferent or cold. There's a, there's a warmth in it. And so I'll be talking a little bit about this, but I just encourage you to see if you can kind of stay in touch with that. And along the way, as we talk tonight, sort of ask yourself, who are you practicing for? Uh, just for yourself or are other people included uh, with you in your practice? So first, what I'd like to do as I, um, uh, you know, as we kind of evolve our approach here, I'm gonna unmute everybody. So you could say hello to each other. And I kind of encourage you if you like, and you don't have to do it, I'll be doing it with you, is to sort of scroll through the screens so you can see all the various people saying hello. So, and if it bugs you, just turn the volume down on your, uh, on your speaker. So everyone's getting <laughs> unmuted. You wanna say hello? Hey. Hello. Hey. Really, really, really good. Okay, that's really great. Okay, so I'm going to now mute everybody. I'm going to be muted. Sorry about that. Okay, good. Um, so I wanted to offer a couple of classic themes in Buddhism, and you'll find these themes in other forms of practice, including in secular forms. So a, a metaphor that's often used is the jewel in the lotus. And historically, this image that has a very Buddhist quality to it, somehow sometimes you'll see pictures of the jewel in the lotus. The lotus uh, arises out of the mud. There's a Zen saying, uh, I understand, no mud, no lotus. So <laughs> that's a really useful thing to appreciate. Uh, and in the early teachings of the Buddha, there's this notion that in the so-called chain or sequence of dependent origination, that suffering is what gives rise step by step by step to awakening. No suffering, no awakening, in effect, which is a way to appreciate our own, our own sorrow, our own weariness, our own fatigue, our own stress, our own pain, that uh, there's a... There's a dignity in accepting our own experience and then moving forward, moving forward from it in our practice. So um, with that as context, right? No mud, no lotus. Uh, the lotus has a jewel in it. And historically, the question is, is the lotus wisdom and the jewel is compassion or is the lotus compassion and the jewel is wisdom, right? Both, and it doesn't really matter, but the two go together. So we have these two fundamental elements. We have wisdom with heart, and we have heart that is wise, the two together. And first, in your own practice, I invite you to consider how are these elements balanced for you? For example, um, I've had times in my life where my, um, you know, I was full of heart, but I was kind of sloppy and <laughs> clueless. <laughs> and I've had other times where there was a lot of analytic clarity, uh, just about the world as well as about my mind, but I wasn't very nice. <laughs> I wasn't very friendly, either to myself or to other people. 
And you may know people like that yourself, or you, you might, um, might think about that for yourself, you know, in your own practice, are you tilted one way or the other? And speaking personally, uh, it's been extremely important to me to really engage the practice of love as a, a foundational process uh, over the last couple of decades. It's been very important to me and, and, to, and to engage that. And you, you might consider something like that yourself. It's interesting that historically, the Buddha is mainly known as a teacher of a kind of fiercely penetrating clarity about the mind process, no nonsense, disenchanted with, um, you know, our ordinary mental processes, sort of, you know, looking um, at it critically. And there's a place for that. There's a place for that kind of analytic clarity, that kind of recognition that so much of what we do actually just creates suffering for ourselves and other people. But when he passed away, uh, the early teachings tended to become increasingly analytic and with the development of various fine grained analyses of the mind with a kind of detached analysis that lacked a certain heart. And then emerging a few centuries later, we have the more Mahayana threads moving into uh, Northern India, into Tibet, and then through Tibet and China to Japan which emphasized the bodhisattva vow, the notion of deferring one's own awakening for the sake of everyone, and the emphasis, emphasis on um, a radiantly loving and caring heart. Recent scholarship, interestingly, has pointed out that in a lot of the early teachings of the Buddha, love is in the foreground, actually. And not just love in terms of moral duty and being appropriate and, you know, acting with wise speech and so forth, but actually a radiantly generous heart, full of love and kindness, full of compassion, uh, with the implication that love is a fully sufficient path of practice. That love, in the broadest sense, releases the contraction of self and opens us out into, in the most, into the most fundamental, the most profound sense of being everything. So by the way, I do not know where those sounds are coming from. And I've muted everyone. I will figure this out later, but I don't know where those sounds are coming from. And Rachel, are you, are you muted? Is everyone muted? I'm muting you, you should be muted. Good, okay. So yeah, we're all learning about Zoom, me especially, anyway. Okay, so that's key point there. Second point, who are we practicing for? Are we practicing certainly for ourselves? There's a place for that. But do we also have a sense of others with us? And I think that's extremely important, especially these days where we're with the coronavirus and so forth, we're pushed closely upon others and we can land on others with a pretty heavy footprint. I've tried to kind of keep in mind, you know, I have this image of golf shoes, I guess. I've never worn golf shoes, but they have those little spikes, I guess, underneath them, track shoes. And we land on each other sometimes with, with like golf shoes, right? We, we land and you can just see the reaction in the face of another person after we do something or say something, literally just subtly, we just turn away kind of dismissively or we move on to the next thing or we don't even notice them. And you can recognize that they've been affected by that. They've been really touched by that. That wasn't good for them. Well, so as we live with other people and work with other people these days, it's really useful to get a sense of, well, in my own personal practice, I'm practicing for me, but I'm also practicing for you. So I don't land on you so hard or so that I have the strength to keep my heart open and really take you into account, let you land inside our mind, my mind. Um, I did my research for my doctorate on 15 month olds, toddlers. And one of the critically important things for, a, for a, all of us as young children and as adults is to feel like we're landing in the mind and heart of another person. 
that they're open to us, emotionally available is the term. Flip it around, other people can land in us and can we give them the gift? Can we have the courage and the depth of our own practice to give them the gift of letting them land in us, to being affectable by other people? That doesn't mean being invaded by other people. If we get invaded or flooded by other people, then we can't sustain this quality of open-hearted uh, equanimity and, and, and relatedness and inner peace with other people. But can we, can we really let them land in us? So we partly practice to have the capacity, to develop the capacity for other people to land in us without um, swamping us, to put it a certain way. So as I will finish soon, because I really want to open it up for discussion tonight to see what you make of this and what are some practical, specific situations about it. What is it like to wake up in the morning, for example, and after establishing just kind of landing and waking up, maybe you haven't gotten out of bed yet, to, to establish your fundamental purpose in this life? What is your purpose in this life? What matters to you? What are you here for, right? Uh, maybe they're words that express that fundamental purpose in life. Maybe there's just sort of a feeling or an image that expresses that fundamental purpose in life. And in that, can there be a benevolence? I wish English had a simpler word than benevolence to describe what I'm talking about. Um, it's a kind of leaning. It's not indifference. It's not complete neutrality, we're, we're kind of for others. We're, we're, we're for them. We're, we're lean toward them. We wish them well. The root of the word benevolence is good wishes, benevole, goodwill. We have good will rather than ill will. Uh, the Buddha really emphasized the importance of disengaging from ill will and resting uh, in good will for others. The will for good, right? Rather than the will for ill. And so, for example, we can establish that purpose. We can bring to mind very specific people. I'm thinking of two people I live with. <laughs> we can bring to mind a very specific people. We can bring to mind people that have done us wrong. And, you know, they may have abandoned us. They may have ill will toward us, but we don't need to abandon them. Uh, even if they're unwilling to have, have contact with us, we can have goodwill toward them in ways that are authentic. So that's something that we can establish. For example, we can establish it in our meditation as we sit here with each other tonight. Are we here for others too? It doesn't mean giving up our own rights, doesn't mean you know, not uh, honoring our own needs, but can we be here for others too? And in the broadest sense, can we be here for all of humanity, ultimately, and even all of life altogether. Can that be part of our practice? Can we, can we include that in some ways, at least a little bit every day? And um, last thing about that is to get a sense of others who are practicing with you, right? In this community right here, right now, uh, the Buddha strongly emphasized Sangha. You know, there's a famous passage, you may know it, uh, where basically his cousin, Ananda, his primary attendant, uh, and he were hanging out, <laughs> as best as I can tell. And they were just hanging out. And Ananda looked at all at the monks, you know, that they were hanging out with, just being together, I guess, after they had their meal, and said, look, this is half the holy life. You know, the implication being one half is what we do internally, the other half is what we do relationally. And uh, so Ananda said to the Buddha, you know, noble sir, look, this is half the holy life here. And the Buddha famously said, not so Ananda, not so. It's the whole of the holy life, this process of practicing in community with others. And um, it's easy to be kind of superficial about this, you know, to have your eyes just sort of glaze over, pass over the various faces on these screens. And it's really quite something neurologically and experientially to slow down for that beat, that second or two or three, where you have a sense of, wow, that really is another person. That's another person over in that little thumbnail image here in the Zoom window. That's another person who wants to live as much as I do, who 
who feels pleasure and pain as, as intensely as I do, who is as real to them. It's hard to believe. I thought I was the only person who mattered. Wait a minute. Every one of you matters to yourself. What? Right? You know, we can have that sense of realizing that. And um, the sense of practicing with others. I like these little meditation apps sometimes where you can see the number of people who are meditating worldwide with you. Uh, we're not alone. We're not alone in our practice, um, both in terms of who we can be for and who we can feel that we are practicing with. And um, I think that it's really important, especially in this time of physical distancing from, from others, to actually really lean into this aspect of practice so that the jewel and the lotus are really, really woven together. Okay. So how about we pause just for a few moments of reflection here. And you might wanna bring to mind one person in your life who you are practicing with. Maybe you're not, doing the same practice, but you know they have a practice. They're a friend who has a practice. Maybe you share a practice. What's it feel like to be practicing with? What's it feel like to be practicing with each other tonight? Can you feel buoyed, supported with the sense of practicing with, that others are practicing too? I'm looking at your faces and I'm really touched that you're practicing with me. You can have a similar kind of experience. So many good people practicing with you. And second, a reflection, pick one person in your life. And you can do this with one person after another, but start with one. One person in your life who matters to you and you are practicing for. so that you can be a little more loving, a little more patient, a little wiser, a little stronger for whatever purpose. Who are you practicing for? You might bring to mind one person after another, even including perhaps difficult people, people who are difficult for you. What's it feel like to recognizing to recognize that you you know that you can practice for them? Perhaps simply to help yourself uh, tolerate them or not be crazy. <laughs> around them, you're practicing for them. You might even think of the people you walk past on the street. If you feel separate, if you feel alone, that you can radiate benevolence and respect for them at a just simple human level. I'll finish here just underlining these key points 
wisdom and compassion together, right? Awareness and heart together and practicing with others and practicing for others. So uh, I invite you at this point to, if you have a question that's related to what I've brought up here, uh, if you raise your hand, I'll quickly scroll through the screens and then unmute you so others can hear your voice. And uh, please, if you do have something to say, you know, keep it relatively succinct and I'll try to be succinct as well. So Gail Demert, I see you, so I'm gonna unmute you, Gail. Hi there. Um, I have been um, really struggling with the technique part of um, meditating, especially recently, it seems. And to comment on your, your, your statement, love is a fully sufficient path of practice, just very coincidentally yesterday, I was listening to the loving, knowing, and growing, and Joseph said something which kind of broke things open for me. I uh -huh. thought I should just share it. I think it's very related. He said that when he was in Barcelona, that he went to see the Gaudi Cathedral, yeah. and on the wall there was the saying, to do things right, first you need love. Yeah. And then technique. Yeah. And that was very helpful for me. And then you, you reinforced it again tonight. So I, oh. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. Right. And exactly. Which would you, if you could only have one, technique or love, which would you pick? Well, I mean, being a scientist, I've always picked the technique. And now I'm realizing it's <laughs> not getting me where I want to go. <laughs> Well, that's great. That's such a great, thank you very much for that, Gail. That's great. Um, so I'll, I'll mute you again. Sorry about that. And then see if there's another question or comment and certainly keep it. I'll just kind of scroll through the windows. Okay, great. I see Karen. I'm going to unmute you, Karen Herzog. Great. Yes, there's a lot of Karens out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that, that, uh, your words had such great impact on me. And particularly uh, during this time, I was super cranky with my daughter before the meditation. I was like, you need to do the dishes and you need to do this. And, da, 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 da. and then I just walked out during the break and I was a completely different person. You know, she kind of looked up with that kind of, Ugh, you know, what's she gonna say now? And I was like, hi, honey, can I warm you some food? Like I was completely different. And so I think when you say practice for, yeah, I think that's kind of where 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 I go. And yeah. so I just wanted you know to say thank you for that. And it definitely, I just have to keep it in mind during these these times. And then uh, secondly, just that facial expression is very important to me with the people on the street, and having the mask on uh, is uh, a challenge because I'm so used to expressing love through my, the way I look at people, the way I beam at them, the way I smile. And it's just such a strange thing to realize, oh wait, n nobody's really looking at me. They're really scared. They're kind of turning away if they're even six feet apart and you feel that kind of instant rejection. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of been like a kind of a double take during the days. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I have a quick comment on that. I, I think that, uh, before this whole pandemic landed on us and our, before our lives were so disrupted, we got away with a lot or we were propped up by our activities and settings and circumstances. And, and it, it, it was helpful. Okay, fine. When that falls away, though, we're left a lot with our own practice and what we've developed inside and the investments, not just that we've made inside ourselves, but that we've made in important relationships. And so now in this current situation, I think in, amidst all the craziness of it and the, the cost of it for so many people, um, we are called to practice in a whole new kind of way. We've got to raise our game, right? You can get away with a lot when the sun is shining and the music is playing, but when you're at 20,000 feet and the wind's howling and you're climbing up with friends and you're helping them along the way, you got to raise your game. And I think that's okay. We're kind of called to be more active uh, inside our own minds because often we can't do anything out in the world, but we do 
had the capacity to be more active in our mind. So for me, there's this place that's really grounded in a, a lot of developmental psychology about the, the sense of the interpersonal field and the ways in which we can kind of passively, inertly, tip, you know, previously have a felt sense of connection with other people. But there is also a place for the active mobilization of a feeling of relatedness. You know, the active mobilization of love. There's a place for that where you deliberately help yourself feel authentically a little more connected, a little more present. And we're, we're partially called to that these days. And um, just to, you know, it's interesting. I had a situation in a very important relationship in my, in my late 20s, early 30s, where uh, I loved this person. And to my astonishment, they were doing all kinds of really problematic things in the relationship. And I had a choice. And the choice I made was to love at will. And that was such a radical thing for me. I had no idea what that was like, not because I was saintly, but just I thought, well, I'm going to keep loving this person. I'm going to love at will. And, you know, long term, I'm going to keep seeing what's actually happening here. But meanwhile, I'm going to love at will. And I, sometimes people think, well, that's, you're just faking it. No, it's doubly loving. It's loving because it's love. And it's loving also because you're bringing your will to bear. You're, you know, you're, you're mobilizing, you're going to the high end of the range of what's authentically caring or compassionate rather than just sinking to the low end of the range for you in that moment. Uh, and I think that's a really useful thing to be aware of, especially these days. Okay. So I'm going to mute you now, Karen, and I'm going to go to, I saw you. Yeah, Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Hi. Great. Um, so I have a comment and a question. Yeah. Um, the comment is that um, for up until 40 days ago, my husband and I often landed on each other and then we would just go and on to the next thing. But the last 40 days, we haven't really had the option of doing that. And we have both learned a lot. We're really practicing together, learning about how we land on each other in those moments before the argument happens. And even if it doesn't happen very often, when it happens, it is really hard. So this has been a great opportunity to practice together that um, I would never have had probably otherwise. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with the process of meditation, okay, and what's going on with me right now. Mm -hmm. um, I get focused, I calm my mind, I let go of, as you have said, the, in the front part of the brain, the planning and all of the, the thinking and projecting and uh, that part kind of goes away and get everything calm. Then I, somewhere around the point of trying to expand into a fuller awareness, the back part of my middle of my brain just takes off. And I have daydream after daydream after, you know, a, tw a two second daydream, bring it back, two second daydream. I have, I have at least 150 scripts in my mind just from tonight alone. Um, do you have any suggestions for dealing with this, you know, daydreamer back here? It's a great question. Uh, it's classic. And for one, there's natural variation, right? People are just, they're, in, they're individual differences, then life lands on us. So part one is just to kind of accept oneself. And, uh, you know, the classic metaphor is that the mind is like a puppy, right? It just wanders off. We bring it back. It wanders off. It brings us back. If we yell at the puppy, it doesn't work. We need to bring a kind of kindness to it. A second thing is, uh, to just really train. So, Shirley, are you able to sustain attention to the internal sensations of breathing? It seems like for the first 20 minutes or so, yeah. And then, yeah. then my mind sort of goes off. I bring it back. I breathe three breaths, and it's off again. Yeah. I think um, I've never seen any research on this. It's a natural phenomenon. Uh, for some people, it's not 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's two <laughs> minutes or it's 20 seconds, right? So that's pretty good. 20 minutes in a row is pretty good. So different things. One is to actually have shorter meditations. Uh, often, the, the little I know of this, Tibetan teachers often will do shorter practices with a real kind of intense muscular focus. That's one thing. Uh, another is to... Let your mind wander a bit, literally. I know this is kind of like a heresy, <laughs> right? You let it wander, and then you bring it back. There's a teacher in Australia, I'm blanking on his name, who actually describes this as a useful, powerful meditation practice. You allow it to wander, and then you 
bring it back and you learn from where it wandered. And in the process of that, you deepen in your insight into that wandering and you, be, and you become increasingly disenchanted with it. It's kind of like, you know how it is, there you are, you want to be entertained, you're looking for some TV and you just, I've had this experience in, in traveling, I'll just scroll through, I'll just channel surf one after the other, nothing's on, but I'll start over. Again, you know what I mean? And then, but there's a lesson that, no, those little inner mini movies, those mental movies, it's not like great, li- you know what I mean? It's not like a great movie. <laughs> you start to realize, oh, reruns, bleh, same old, same old, you know? They, they, did, they definitely brought the B team to that inner movie, right? And so you can become disenchanted, you could do that. And then the last thing I just would suggest or wonder is to really bring heartfeltness into it, you know? to feel sensations around the heart, to bring lovingness into it. And as we were exploring, if you could do it in the practice, which was a sophisticated practice I took you through tonight in its three parts, establishing steadiness, moving into awareness, just awareness, presence, right? And then finding an authentic way to imbue that awareness with warmth, with benevolence, however it was felt, a kind of leaning for others, right? That's a real practice. But what can happen is you just start to rest in your own deep nature. Our, our deep nature really is spaciousness, presence, wakefulness, and lovingness. It really is, that's our nature. So we, we can, boom open into that and that can have a real stability to it. It's kind of also helpful to get a sense of the whole and you're widening out. You you can even make this gesture, you know, that I'm doing just kind of naturally. And I really am not a space cadet woo woo kind of guy, you know, but I've just really learned that this quality of openness is kind of like opening into spaciousness. That's our actual ground. And it's, yeah, go on, Shirley. And then I'll move on to someone else, yeah. Yeah, I thought of the um, um, the teaching you had a, a week ago about Sharon uh, Saltzman's The Train Moving Through the Meadow. And, yeah. and sometimes you're on the train and then you come back, but um, the warm-heartedness is a new aspect. I like that, and I will try that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, and to feel that that's kind of innate. Okay, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna mute you, and then I, I'll do one more person. Let's see, I'm gonna scroll through. Anybody have a comment? Great, Julian, unmuting you. How's it going? Hey. I, uh, uh, so I'm trying to be quick. I've been meditating pretty heavily for the last three years in the insight tradition. So all the right. teachers that you know, like Joseph, uh, Tara, uh, yeah. uh, Sharon, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and over the pandemic break, I've recently just like really have, have kind of solidified what I want to do for the rest of my life, which is like be a meditation teacher, bring it to people in, in, in the, the disadvantaged community. I started applying for the uh, Tara Back, Jack Hornfield uh, Mindful Great. Meditation Program. Um, I have a call on Monday to talk about that, et cetera. Um, and uh, so the thing that I've been struggling with that I know I shouldn't struggle with, but I am, um, especially as I'm like trying to take this seriously, is that I realized that the people in particularly the insight community, um, they're not necessarily of, uh, what is it? The, 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 the demographic that, that I'm in, you know what yep. I mean? Like scroll past uh, the zoom pages yeah. here. It's like the, the, the age bracket, let's say, and, and <laughs> the, oh, yeah. the racial makeup is not necessarily like, is not necessarily matching me or really, the community that I want to serve. And it's something that I struggle with a lot because it, I fell into this community, but it's not, it doesn't feel like it's necessarily accessible. Yeah. To who I think really need it. Like the poor disadvantaged people, inner city kids and things like that. And I, I kind of just wanted to know what you had to, to say about that. You're naming something super real, absolutely real. Um, and it's a topic that uh, you know many well-intended people struggle with, right? 
Uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, where do you live? Uh, Los Angeles. Okay. Um, yeah. So I go to Insight School that Trudy started and yeah. Scott and stuff. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I've so uh, what one thing that I've learned about this is I like a older white dude. Okay, uh, is that um, so? I've gone through trainings and so forth in which there was a very strong um, element in it in which there was attempting to be more inclusive with you know forgive me with the languaging here, but teachers of color, let's say, and one of the things they said. So I've learned a lot from them. Right, and what they often would say is that it's really important to look for uh, teachers of color oneself, and to look for communities, as you're saying, where there is that greater representation, so you don't feel like the only person in the room. And um, so I know in the Bay Area, and you can see some of the chats that are popping up. There are uh, suggestions for that, and people like that. Um, I think of Alyssa Dennis. I don't know if you do you know Alyssa Dennis, Alyssa Dennis down in LA. I have no, I don't. Oh, so for example, I uh, she was one of the co-teachers with me of this uh, neurodharma retreat I taught, and okay. what a wonderful teacher, uh, African American woman, um, psychologist. Yeah, Alyssa Dennis, D E N. I believe it's one N I S, or maybe it's two N's. D E Alyssa. A-L-I-S-A. Julian, if you want to, and I also know some other communities as well. If you want, uh, re contact me through my website, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, you know, do everything I can to connect you with other people. Because the issue you're, in, you're naming is absolutely real. Um, it's absolutely real. And I remember this very haunting um, thing someone said in a training I was in, which was, they said, you know, nothing's really going to change until I see people like me in the front of the room. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, appreciation to you for being on the path you're on. There have been major efforts to be more inviting and more, you know, inclusive in various ways. So I have a long way to go. Uh, but finding, you know, like-minded people, people similar way, you know, backgrounds, ways to talk, similar interests even, you know, in terms of working with different, with, with, with particular uh, groups of people, really, really central and fundamental, I think. Right. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Thank please you. reach out to me and I'll, I'll definitely connect you with Elisa and there are a few other people I immediately think about who are really good resources in this area. Right. Thank you so much. Oh, 100%. Thank you very much.